Wilmington to get the shots rather than it be somewhere local in their area. Thank you so much, Darius. Any, I, I can broaden this out to, are there any partnerships you want to have or anything that you know you wish were happening in the realm of vaccinations that you're still kind of working on? This is an odd off the wall thing, but I saw the most disturbing thing that people were able to purchase a vaccination card kind of in the black market because there's no control mechanism on them. And I know they're working on it, um, but I would be happy to see when they get a QR code on them or something so that, you know, I don't know that there's not all these fake cards floating around out there. Um, so anyway, hopefully that's to come soon. And I don't know what that means for people that have already been vaccinated get a new card i don't know so that's just my thought this is a message for um i guess the shelters too i'm serving on i guess as a statewide the vaccination work group committee and this is the committee that had been trying to work with um, public health and agencies and pharmacies to try to have uh, vaccination events around the state and but public health is open to having um site so site vaccination events too so if any of the shelters if you guys want to have a site-based um, vaccin vaccination clinic they are open to doing that and i think it's lisa henry at lisa.henry at delaware.gov um, i think she would be the contact at public health if you want to have a um, an event at your at your facility, Lisa, do you know? Do you have to have the ultra cold storage to do that? Because in the beginning, I explored that, and it was the biggest concern there was having refrigeration in place on site. Well, I think when they the 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 issue with the the vaccinations and the events is that they have them already in the cold storage. If they plan an event for you. They will break because it has to kind of be thawed out or cooled off or something by the time they give the vaccine. So I think they do if they're having the events, they do that part outside and then they have that um, specified period of time where they're going to do the event and they'll bring the vaccines to do that. So you wouldn't have to worry about storing the okay. vaccines. Thank you. And then Lisa would be a good person. I'm pretty sure that's the right answer, <laughs> but you can ask her as well. And Lisa, do you know if, um, so I know the Division of Public Health had some type of mobile unit for vaccinating folks. It's like a van, it probably has like the cold storage in it. Do you know anything about that or how to connect folks with, I don't know if that's kind of what they would use to come on site and do it. That's probably what they're using for on site as a part of it anyway, because a lot of the on the, the ones they've done were on sites were drive through. They're not actually bringing people into a van to vaccinate them. It's a drive through situation. So um, I don't know about the van with the cold storage or too much about that, but I do know most of their efforts have been drive through. And I know some of the state service centers with the health centers that are inside the state service centers, they have been working with them as well. I don't think you have to worry, you would have to worry about the cold storage if you schedule something and they actually have a schedule that they, that they come out to do it. They'll, have, they'll be prepared for that and have the doctors and the nurses and I think um, University of Delaware nursing students and maybe some Dell Tech nursing students are actually helping to administer the vaccines too. That is excellent information, Lisa. I think that's super helpful for everyone. Um, I yeah, also they were doing a great job. First, first, first and second shots. <laughs> that's 
screen. And I know we talked about earlier that, you know, there was a little bit of either hesitancy or just people not thinking that they needed the second shot or not wanting to get the second shot. Um, I would love to hear like any ideas around how can you support that? I have some ideas, but I'd love to hear if anyone else has, um, you know, what have you seen successful for getting people to come back out and get the second one if they're getting the Pfizer or Moderna? I think right now, just for the state of Delaware, just being on that committee, I just get some information <laughs> that they are doing a massive, um, well, DHSS is doing a marketing campaign and they're trying to hit those different groups that are feeling each different way. You know, they're trying to um, build out on that. So we may see some ads. Um, and of course, on the social media, they're doing a great job with that, getting it out. Well, and I know that there was some consideration to having, you know, trying to prioritize Johnson and Johnson for folks experiencing homelessness, given that they move around so much. And then with the pause in that, I think that might have put some some wrinkles in the plans that some folks had at either Division of Public Health or I know um, uh, Dr. Gibney um, recently hosted a vaccination event or, you know, participated in and put the shots in the arms at the Sunday breakfast mission in Wilmington. Um, that the, the hope originally was to use Johnson and Johnson to avoid, um, you know, folks maybe not having full protection with the second shot. Um, I don't know when that will be re launched that I'm not fully up to date in the most recent news on Johnson and Johnson. Um, so I, th I think coming back for a second one's going to be hard. I will tell um, those of you who are on here and you CMIS, <laughs> um, there is a way to upload documents into the system um, if you want to. Um, and if clients are comfortable with having like evidence of their, you know, the, a copy of their first vaccine of their vaccination card that has the date of the first one and the type like uploaded into their client profile in CMIS, it's a way to just have that be somewhere electronically. So if they go end up going to another shelter or somewhere, um, that record is there um, of where and when and what type of their, their first shot they got. Um, so it is a functionality that's possible for you if you're using CMIS. And if you have any questions about that, um, please feel free to reach out to our CMIS staff. I don't know if this fits in with, with what um, Rachel was just saying at all, but I the last time I asked on this work group committee about the Johnson & Johnson and homeless people or people who were relatively transient, the feeling was that they were not going to use Johnson and Johnson specifically to target that group of that population, because then um, that's what you're doing. You're you're targeting that population, and they didn't want it to seem, um, what's the word, um, like they were just targeting that population for the single. Even though it makes sense to all of us, because. You give them the one and done, then you don't have to hunt people down to try to give them their second vaccine. But they didn't want to um, cause a situation where the public would feel like you were um, mal targeting that group. So um, they weren't through this, this work group committee anyway, they were not using Johnson & Johnson in that fashion or had reconsidered it, I should say. And, you know, I think, um you know, if Johnson & Johnson, once we get past this pause, you know, I think it's having avail availability to all of the different vaccines is incredibly helpful, just like, you know, for people experiencing homelessness, just as for the general population. So if someone would prefer one, you know, definitely making that accessible, but continuing on with vaccinations with the two doses, um, there's also advantages. And one of the things I wanted to talk about with possible um, strategies is, you know, getting the vaccine, that can be an opportunity to engage people in other services. So one thing we've seen be really successful is if you're having a vaccination event, you know, you're providing food and socks and other basic needs at those events. And then instead of it being, you have to come back in three weeks to get your vaccination, it's come back to the same place, same time in three weeks, we have food, we have, you know, we'll help you get connected to all of these resources and you get your second vaccine. So it's 
it's kind of a multi service event, um, but helps having those two interactions can really help you stay engaged with someone and maybe build some trust, maybe get them started on a housing process. I know that's that's always the ideal. I know it doesn't always work out like that in practice, but you know, providing those opportunities, especially if we're going to be having two engagements with people, really making the most of it at that time. I have a kind of an off the wall question. We are providing rapid rehousing services to homeless in motel hotels. And a lot of times there's large populations of those people in one place. Has anyone heard of them just holding an event like on, you know, one of those places in Dover that would be, some of those hotels are within walking distance of each other. So I don't know, like I said, it, I haven't heard that, but it might be a, a good idea and a way to get a lot of people. Um, Cause we know a lot of the people in those hotel motels um, or staying there for a long time. So they're not as transient. It was just a thought as you were talking. And I am not, I'm really in depth in the program side of things as the executive director. So that may be happening and I just don't know it. I'm not sure the extent to which that's happening everywhere. I think it's happened at a couple of places. Um, so Hope Center, obviously, um, which a lot of folks are there through the State Service Center Hotel Motel um, program. Um, I think I'm looking at Lisa just because she it says DSSC, <laughs> just because she's because <laughs> she's with that department. I don't know if she would know this or not, though. I think they might have done one. Um, they have like a hundred or so families, some really large amount of families. Don't quote me on the number. Staying at a particular hotel in Newark. I think they did a vaccination event there. Um, so I think there's been some effort at some sites, but I think it's been probably targeted to the places that have the highest number of people at this point in them. And I know there are a lot of those smaller hotels that might have 10, 10 households or, right? Um, and the extent to which that's happening, I'm not sure. Um, they are, doing that, but they also said they're open to, they just want to reach everybody. So I don't know how public health will coordinate it, but they said they they're not looking at the hundreds and the you know they can do small events too. That's what they said in the meeting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. And you know, I think wherever you can find those opportunities, another thing we've seen in other communities that has worked well is finding um, places where people might already be going, you know, daily or you know pretty frequently throughout the week, like food. Like food banks are um, day centers or, you know, so even if they're not residing there, places where not only where people are frequenting, but also they're almost part of each other's bubble anyway, because they're coming there so often that you're also reducing the risk of transmission if you're helping get everyone, um, everyone there vaccinated. So once again, it, you're, you're partnering services with the vaccine, which I think can make it a little bit more um, palatable for some people. It's it's not just a vaccination event, it's meeting multiple needs. Yes. Um, for myself, not necessarily with work I'm doing with Catholic Charities, but because I'm a part of a divine non-fraternity and sorority, um, we've been able to use um, some of the more of the undergrads, like far as my fraternity cap off facade, we've been able to use some of our undergrads and really have conversations with the students on the campuses and the surrounding communities, because um, one of the topics that came up in our last meeting was um, as far as cultural, cultural wise, vaccinations hasn't always been a positive history in the black community. And so a lot of people are, are being very biased and negative towards the vaccination. And it sounds like what we talked about earlier that a lot of people are waiting to see what happens to the people who are getting these first rounds of shots because. Darius, I think you froze on my screen. Is yeah. there, is, mm -hmm. oh no. I think that was such an excellent point too that. Um, I think he is frozen. Yeah, it looks like we lost Darius briefly, but I just want to amplify there's this point that like there is, and I think we got to this earlier, but just reiterating that you know, people 
hesitancy or their concerns are very valid. Like we never ever want to make people feel like their concerns aren't heard or that, you know, they are, you know, that their concerns are unreasonable. There are absolutely significant reasons to want to see more and to know more about what the vaccination process means. And it is all about empowering people to make that decision for their own health. So, um, and recognizing the complex, you know, the histories of uh, racial inequities of all of that. I, I think Darius was making a great point and Darius, we lost you, but. Yeah, I'm sorry, I had to come outside. Our uh, internet signal is like, it, it fades in and out sometimes, so I apologize. Mm -hmm. But as I was saying though, I think that that fear, especially with the younger generation, because especially in college, they're gonna go party. They're gonna go still be involved in social activities. And so the main thing is just getting them that awareness and, and really trying to encourage them. But even like someone as myself who was a little reluctant, um, I always encourage someone to, you know, save a life in regards to getting, getting what's needed to save your life. But I'm also a little hesitant myself personally, just because I wanna see how it turns out. I don't know too many people of my age bracket or close to my community that has taken the shots, but also in the same has in the same token, they've also feels though because they've already maybe already had COVID that they are immune. Darius, that is everything that you said is an excellent point. I think something that we should all be carrying with us as we do our work because those are important considerations, and it is once again it is okay if people are not ready right now. There is there is access and there are opportunities. So just providing that those opportunities to learn more, to get more information and to see how the process goes can be what helps people go from hesitancy to acceptance. Um, this was a fantastic conversation about vaccinations. And we, if you have any additional questions, if you want additional resources, um, please feel free to share in the chat. You can reach out to myself or Rachel directly and we can we can keep the conversation about this going. Uh, but we also want to dedicate some time to thinking about planning for reopening of, um, you know, of all of our programs and what it means to increase to full capacity when that time comes. Um, so are, are your programs thinking about what that means about planning for reopening and going to full capacity? I think, I think, I just want to say, I think that's a good question. Part of, part of the challenge of reopening to full capacity is that although uh, for, from the Ministry of Caring standpoint, at least we've had all our staff who wanted to get vac vaccinated, vaccinated. However, those 10% who does not want to get vaccinated and, re and, 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 and moving towards reopening fully is still a challenge because we will have some folks on our staff who have not gotten vaccinated, do not want to get vaccinated. So I think that, I think, and hopefully CDC and others will come down with a policy or, or some type of guise of how do you address the folks who, who work for you, who, who decline in the uh, vaccine. And um, kind of what we're dealing with now, other than those 10% who decided they don't want the vaccine, no matter what we sell you, no matter what the encouragement is, no matter what the support is, they don't want it, but they're still employed here. So that's a challenge to reopen fully. That's a great point. Thank you so much for sharing that. I imagine it might be something like uh, the TV um, where a lot of employers require TV um, tests. I think maybe that may be something that they may be looking at as, as far as regulations. Mm. I think one of the things, so I don't, again, we don't operate like a direct, we don't operate a shelter or a direct service program. Um, but I've been struggling with these thoughts a lot um, for our organization. We don't have the office space to have every staff member have their own individual office. So thinking about like, you know, we have large offices, so people were sharing space, but like, who's comfortable sharing space, who's not? Not everyone's planning, not everyone has gotten vaccinated, not everyone wants to get vaccinated. And then, and then, okay, so let's say we don't bring everyone back into the office, do we bring some people who comes back, whose priority to come? I mean, it's, it's like, I'm like constantly staring at this like map of our office and going like, what am I doing? Um, and why am I doing it? Um, so, uh, you know, I know it's different when, obviously when you're directly serving clients in a housing environment or a shelter environment, but I think it's, you know, I'm very curious if folks have any um, 
you know, our plan as an organization has always been around like public public health metrics, not necessarily a timeline. And but but now that the whole vaccination thing makes it's just it's very complicated. So I'll just stop. I'll just stop. And I was just wondering if folks had, especially like those of you who are directly serving clients um, in emergency shelters or in supportive housing programs. Um, how, do you have any like thoughts about like what would lead you to say, okay, we have a 20 bed shelter. We've been operating with 10 beds. Now we're ready to increase to 15 beds. Or is that, are we not there yet? And I'm just curious what folks thoughts are. Yeah, I think we, I think from the minute, from our programming standpoint, I think we're there. The unfortunate uh, challenge with that even is that we've offered uh, in our shelters that have uh, those residents vaccinated and most of those residents who are in shelter care they declining also. So that brings on an additional challenge for us right. to really open fully. Yeah, because it's just not vaccination among staff, it's vaccination right. among residents and how to keep residents safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there Derek, are still some challenges without question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Darius, um, do you mind if I, if I call on you for a second? Um, we were in a conversation um, with Jen Parsons um, from Catholic Charities recently um, talking about, and vaccinations came up and she was talking about how she had almost no one on her uh, rapid re, you know, she does the rapid rehousing component. And she had almost none of her clients um, wanting to get vaccinated. So I was um, curious if that's uh, true as well in the like shelter, among shelter residents at Catholic Charities, if folks aren't interested or if it just varies. So what we're finding, um, and it just, I guess it's, I guess, to process of development or progression. Um, so we have a couple of residents that are, have been fortunate enough to build enough uh, equity for themselves and um, are looking at places to, to go to move. And so the conversation is, you know, as we continue to talk to them, the conversation is not only about, you know, helping them with bills and, and you know, maintaining a, a structured life so they can so it can be sustainable, but also about health health as well. And so, um, two of them are actually, like I said before, they weren't they weren't necessary for it, but they actually are looking into the process of seeing about you know asking certain questions about the vaccination. Um, the big thing is for them is consistency with work because they don't want to be out of work because they're already in a situation where it's kind of like, you know, they're compromised. And so I think that's a large part for, for the residents, uh, especially the two that I'm thinking of right now, because they have not been exposed to COVID. They've, they've been lucky to be able to avoid it and, you know, take necessary precautions. And the last thing, um, you know, one of the gentlemen, he has said, he said, listen, it's like getting a flu shot. It's like, it's, like, it's giving it to you. So, but if I never had any issues and I continue doing what I'm doing, mm. do I truly need it? And so um, that's kind of where we're at. But once again, we always, in regards to saying, hey, protect your life, save a life in the, in the sense of, you may be asymptomatic and you're not knowing. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, um, I, I think we are going to get a positive result from that. Um, the case manager here, Vicky, she continues to talk with them daily as they go through their process. Um, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping that turns out to be true because then they could be, you know, kind of like the spokespersons to the other residents here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess I, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm just wondering how, the extent to which residents are either interested in or accessing vaccinations and how that is influencing people's thoughts about capacity in their programs. Um, awesome. Also in a group. Or if folks just haven't haven't gotten there yet because it's not we're not there yet, and that's fine too. Um, right. I'm also, thinking through. Also in the group, um, someone mentioned to me that, and it, and, and it stuck out to me because it made sense. They're recovering, and needles is a big thing for them, and so the vaccination right now, all we know is that there's a shot. It's like and triggering, so, yeah. <laughs> The trigger. It's the trigger. Yeah. That's an excellent point. And, you know, I think we've talked about some of the vaccine hesitancy. Um, I, I think also thinking about what does that mean for 
how we, in, in general, not just because of vaccine hesitancy, but what protocols are you planning to keep in place even as you move, increase capacity and move towards reopening? You know, we know that vaccinations are only one piece of the puzzle. You know, wearing masks are still encouraged. Um, what, what policies and protocols, even if you haven't quite gotten there, do you see staying in place as you move towards full capacity? Yeah, I think I know that we are we are we are most folks in my administrate in the administrative building here are vaccinated, uh, maybe one or two or not, but we still um, operate with social distancing. Uh, we don't use the kitchen at or a conference room at all because we want to keep that those room free of uh, gatherings. Um, everyone here has to wear a mask once they walk out their office. Uh, they, it's it's required. Uh, so yeah, I, and, I, and of course we have san, um, sanitizer all around the building. So where you go, you can um, spray some sanitizer. Or, um, so we, we and I think the plan is, I'm pretty sure the plan is to keep all those um, all those in place as we go forward, unless we get to a place where we're totally free and don't have to worry about this um, uh, virus. I think for the next year, year and a half, we're going to be operating this way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been sitting for for us right now currently at Casa. Um, the main thing is about um, it's, it's really about effective mapping for us the residents because the residents that have been here longer, it's easier to do them into a room together. And as we think about opening up further and um, open up to focus, making sure that the group or like the quote unquote control group is still at the base of that they're safe and that as we're adding new counterparts to um, the residents and equations that we continue to do the same thing, but then follow up with our base and control group because reality is, you know, we can clean three times a shift a day, but all it takes is for one person to go outside to be exposed to someone. And that's how it starts, you know, even with staff ourselves, we have to take necessary precautions because we all have different lives. And, you know, and it's for people have multiple jobs. And so they're around different environments. And then you all come into one setting and where things are relaxed here may not relax in other places. And so that has been um, a viable lesson of experience um, for us here at CASA. Any other reflections on what what you plan to do or what you think you might plan to do in terms of reopening and increasing capacity? I do think we ought to be slow to reopen fully because uh, this COVID is, is the variants are out there and, and you see spikes in New Jersey, you see spikes in um, uh, Pennsylvania, also even within our administration here, at, oh, I'm sorry, our organization had the Ministry of Care, we're starting to see uh, folks who are, or who, who decided not to get the vaccine beginning to catch the virus all of a sudden. So I think we, I think we need to tread lightly and carefully as we uh, work to reopen. Absolutely. I'm so ready <laughs> to, to be done. Um, and it's just not done with us yet. That's right. So it is not time to, uh, I definitely would not say it's time to reduce our uh, protocol, our safety protocols, that's for sure. I mean, especially in Delaware, I'm like, can the numbers just go down? And for some reason they keep going up and it's, yeah. 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 And I think that, you know, in terms of just maintaining those safety protocols, also maintaining the messaging around, you know, Darius, I think you were getting to this really well earlier. You know, these are little steps, you know, things like washing your hands, wearing a mask, but they can really help save, they could help save a life. They could help, you know, really prevent the spread, reduce transmission, all of those things, um, you know, keeping that messaging going that we still need an active effort, even, even if you are vaccinated, even if most of the people around you are vaccinated, because we all have our our own lives and our own bubbles and we keep intersecting with different people. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, I think our, it, what we're talking about now, the job is gonna be harder with 
you know, the suspension of Johnson and Johnson and people who had it in their mind that I'm never going to do this now have another reason not to do it. So the messaging from, you know, from the federal government, and, et cetera, and doctors, and it's going to be very important. I mean, when you look at the numbers, it was it's extremely, extremely small. But the fact is, it's made uh, it's made the, the news so much that for people who didn't want to get it, it, this is another reason not to get a, a vaccine, any vaccine. So I think that's going to make it a little tougher to reopen um, because it's going to take some time. There are people, uh, and I've run into a couple who said, okay, I'm going to get the vaccine now because I know people who got it and they didn't grow extra noses or anything like that. So I'm going to go ahead and get it, but that's going to take time. Mm -hmm. I was one of those people, Chuck. I'm scheduled to get mine on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody around me, my closest friends and my family. So I said, even though I'm still not 100% comfortable, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And maybe I'll call Darius if I have an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's funny. It's really funny to me that you said growing additional noses because it was literally a joke in our, I mean, my household's three people. One of them is a child. In our little household, it was a joke like, okay, we might grow ears on our backs, but I guess we're just going to do it. We kept, for some reason, growing ears on our backs became like a thing we would say. <laughs> I just think that we now we now know that what uh, over 100 million people taking the shot, and you have very few cases of adverse effects. So that tells me something right there. Um, at least that's the, the communication. Ears, the ears about. on my back aren't going to go grow for like two years, John. <laughs> <laughs> Got you. I'm just kidding. Yes, I agree. I, I think the issue that bothers me most about this right now is that on a, a concentrated level, we are, especially at, like I'm sure other places, but here at Costa specifically, you know, we have hunger, homelessness, and now we have the diversion of the pandemic. And it's like, you know what, you, I still go to gas stations, we see people that are homeless, you know, that they're, 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 they could re really be taking advantage of these services. And then the flip side of it is that we've seen people take advantage of these services and really like take advantage of an opportunity that could be better afforded to someone who needs these opportunities. And so, you know, thinking outside the box, you know, I would love the idea that Ms. Lisa, Ms. Lisa mentioned about hosting a vaccination. That would be something I would need to talk to my superiors about because this is an idea to get one vaccinated, you know, you need food or clothing. We have it here at, at CASA you know, something along those lines. And so I think that, you know, the pitch when we're talking to these people that even on the fence, that if you offer, if you bundle it together, it sounds nice. Yeah, and you know, I would also say that even, it doesn't even have to be like, you have to come to this event and get the vaccination and then you get these things. It can be like, you know, yeah. there is this event happening, it has food, it has like, all, there's no requirement to receive anything. You can come and get services. And then if you choose to get a vaccine, that's, so maybe they come to, if you're able to hold a recurring event, maybe they come to the first one, see other people getting vaccinated. They're, they're like, mm -hmm. okay, this isn't so bad. And then one or two events down the line, they're more open to receiving it. And I, I really love, Darius, the point, there's still a lot of work to do. There's still mm -hmm. outreach that needs to happen. There's still, mm -hmm. there are still people who aren't engaged in our system at all. Um, so how we can keep that work going at the same time where we always have like 17 hats, right? So just keeping, keeping everyone engaged in all these different ways. I think too, with some of the pop-up events, um, even though public health wants to have these events, something someone just said triggered another thought. They still want to have, they still want to know that people are coming. So they would have people register because no one wants to waste the vaccine. So we need to kind of, and then also prepare for people who just, who may just pop up or people who may end up being no-shows. 
But I do believe that that may be one of the, the requirements that you have to get people registered to say that they will come. And we have volunteers that are actually um, calling people to make sure that they're gonna come that day. If people are in need of, one of the recent things we've been talking about are the, um, is ADA, making sure that people who may have uh, disabilities of any kind and need that extra assistance that we can um, have people on hand to help them with that. If they're, if they're blind and they need someone to help to walk them to wherever they need to go and that sort of thing. So keep that in mind when you try to plan these events. But again, that's something that Lisa Henry can definitely discuss with you also, but keep that in mind. That's a great point, Lisa. And in terms of that, um, providing those updates and the you know, registration, and I think collecting data for people experiencing homelessness can always, that can always be a difficult process. Um, so I'm wondering if anyone has any advice on how they've been able to, um, you know, like what data they've been able to collect and like how you can stay in touch with people in order to get that registration information, keep in contact for a second vaccine, anything like that. I know that's a hard question, especially if they're not connected to a program already. Um, it can be hard to get that information. Difficult for the more transient people, because some people who are actually staying in the shelters or in transitional housing, it'd be a little bit easier. But for people who are coming for a night, um, that may be more difficult. And I think that's where the, the work route was, had, was going. We can't just focus on on the Johnson and Johnson and ear market just for this group of people because that would be discriminatory. That was the word I was looking for earlier. <laughs> Rachel, I'm wondering if you have any other questions about vaccines and reopening? No. Um I mean, I, it was really helpful to hear from folks. Um, the goal here was just to give people an opportunity to share information and share concerns, um, talk about things that are and aren't working well for them. Um, so I don't have anything else. I don't have any other questions either, but I just wanted to provide you know, an opportunity if anyone has anything else they wanna share, Chuck? Yeah, well, I don't have information today, but we'll have some next week. We are doing an event, um, on Monday, if all goes well, at the, um, the Red Roof Inn in Newcastle uh, with Dr. Gibney. Um, so it'll be interesting to see the response that we get from the clients. Um, we're doing clients, we're doing anybody who's at the hotel and, and staff. So we'll have some, some sort of firsthand knowledge of kind of the response that we get, uh, any pushback, any you know, hesitancy. So we can report that at, uh, at a later date. Chuck, is that the, um, thank you for that. Is that the, the place where there's a lot of families? There are quite a few families there. Or is that um, different? I, I remember uh, the, there the being. Other one, the other one is the Red Roof Inn in Newark. Okay, that's the one doing, I was thinking the, of. We're doing the one in Newcastle first. Okay, gotcha. So there, there was a question before you joined the group from Mamie um, at People's Place. I'm wondering if there were efforts to go to some of the hotel sites where homeless folks were staying to do on-site um, vaccinations because they're working, um, they are doing, you know, as you know, at People's Place right. doing rehousing in Kent County. And I thought there may have been some efforts on, underway at some locations, but I wasn't sure. So that's helpful. Thank you. Oh, yeah, and, you know, we're, we'll, we'll kind of look at this, as you know, in the fall, we did uh, what nine or 10 of those motels where we had folks where we did the, the COVID testing. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of the, the next step and we'll see how it goes, um, you know, how much of the vaccine is available. Um, you know, we, we were kind of, when we first thought about it, we're thinking that the, uh, the Johnson and Johnson would be a good, good way to go, but you know, that's sort of mm -hmm. up in the air at this point. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll use this as our, our guinea pig, if you will. And then, you know, start looking at some other locations. Um, and Dr. Gibney said, you know, she's going to go knock door to door in the hotel. With, uh, and so we'll have staff there and also. She is rogue full time out there, just vaccinated. Yeah. She 
Yeah. yeah. So she's, we we, we do have also have an event tomorrow. Uh, we're going to do this for the first time also at uh, for all the guests who come to uh, Emmanuel Dining Rooms to have a breakfast or lunch. We're going to be given have them have opportunity to get the vaccine tomorrow. So we'll see this, <laughs> see how this works out for the first time uh, tomorrow at That's noon. Awesome. Uh, so folks who come in for a new meal, they'll have opportunity to get the vaccine. So we'll see how that turns out. That's awesome, John. Is that with um, St. Francis? Actually, that's with uh, the Ministry of Care. We we we've we've been in contact with the state, and we have a nurse on on staff, nice. of course, and we've been able to get some vaccines. Very cool. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Just an announcement: I'm getting my vaccine done at Claymont Community Center, and they still have they still encouraging people to come and and um, get vaccinated, but you have to get a voucher. So I think they're giving out vouchers at the center, you just have to go so you can get a time slot. Mm -hmm. And then they give you they give you the form that you have to fill out. You can fill out the form before you get there, but they're still looking for people. They're gonna do 300. They, they're gonna try to, they're gonna be prepared to do 300. So if you hear or need anyone, have them con contact the Claymont Community Center. Great, thank you. I see lots of exciting work and events going on. You guys are rock stars, especially I know a lot of places have been a little bit um, like jolted by the J and J news, and I'm really excited to hear everyone just you know you're keeping going. You have these events planned. You you know keeping the word out there. So just really exciting, and definitely yeah. Please do share with us any um, insights, yeah, you know, lessons learned from your events that are coming up because that's exciting. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for being with us today um, and for your participation. I hope that you found this useful um, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, appreciate it. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. See ya.